practice of love. Ten years ago, I started a research project that involved asking people in community or organisational workshops what they consider of infinite value. Things of infinite value were defined as that which is sacred, precious, special, of value for its own sake, that which makes the world truly alive. People were told they could offer anything they wished, emotions, relationships, parts of the natural world, objects or qualities. Their things of infinite value could be as personal to them or as general as they liked. Over the years, I've asked this of thousands of people, inside and outside Aotearoa, New Zealand. 1,080, all within New Zealand, were part of a formal research project. Here's a word cloud that represents what the 1,080 people said. Love, family, happiness, nature, artistic expression, empathy, laughter, the ocean. As you can see, the single most common offering was love. In some workshops, people were able to discuss and explain the things of infinite value that they had offered. What do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? Some of those who offered love explained that they weren't just talking about love of particular people, but an orientation to the world as a whole. We could call this generalised love. It's hard to say exactly what an orientation of generalised love involves, or to know if people are all experiencing it in exactly the same way. But it seems to include a sense of wonder, deep appreciation for what is, and extreme benevolence, wanting the best for everything. When we are in love, in this sense, we're fully present to the moment, the place we're in, and the people we're with. At its most intense, generalised love has a porous quality, as if the world is welcome right inside us, even at the risk of harm to ourselves. In this sense, we're a bit like the parent who sits with their child when they're sick with an infectious disease, say COVID-19 perhaps. The parent knows that in one sense, the child's breath is actually toxic at that time. But being intimate with that child, physically and emotionally, overwhelms the possibility of fear. Practicing this kind of love then involves openness to what's happening and also, importantly, the potential to be transformed by it. Interestingly, this is actually in one sense our natural state. We are quite literally in constant relationship to what is around us. Take breathing, for example. We breathe in about 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen, and less than 1% carbon dioxide. We breathe out 16% oxygen, 78% nitrogen, and 4% carbon dioxide. So what's happened there? Well, we've given up some carbon, the building block of our body, in exchange for the oxygen we need to produce energy. Those fragments of carbon that we breathe out are actually, in a sense, little pieces of us. They re-enter the ecosystem and perhaps end up in the trunk of a tree outside your window. Life at the biological level is relationship. One way of thinking about the experience of generalised love then is that it's embracing the truth of relationship now at the psychological level. It's allowing ourselves to accept and to relax into the poor state of being human. Generalised love, I suggest, is an orientation that can help us be in genuine relationship with others, respond to others without violence or verbal abuse, and have the cross-culture, cross-sector, cross-community conversations we need to tackle the wicked problems that we face including climate change and material inequality, two of the big ones. I'm going to talk through each of these in turn. Let's start with how the practice of love can create genuine relationship with others. 
An example I love comes from the research of my doctoral student, Leon Russell. His project involved looking into the MIND program. This is an Auckland-based program for young people with a history of offending. It's basically a community-based alternative to incarceration, and it's managed by the Graham Dingle Foundation. As part of MIND, each participant has a youth worker that helps them tailor their experience and acts as a mentor throughout. Here's what one of the young men said about his youth worker. Yeah, we clash, but we're like, all good. I've got mad love for him, straight up. He's one of the reasons why I come every day. He can bring a lot. His personality is on. He's talented, he's straight up, he's always encouraging me. He's always got love for me. Like he's always got time for me. He's a hard worker too. Even though I give him hard times, he still pushes me to be successful. What do we see here? Well, most of all, it's commitment to relationship and it's reciprocal. The young man and the love and the youth worker seem to love each other. And it's also clear that both parties really have to work at it. The young man admits that he gives his youth worker hard times and that they clash, but they each keep showing up. The young man comes to the program each day. The youth worker's always got time for him. We really get the impression that this young man is in a constant state of gratitude, maybe even amazement, that this adult human being who's, who's hardworking, who's talented, has got time for him, is encouraging him. And when we think about that, that parent with a sick child and what they're teaching that child, they're teaching them to trust. And the same thing's going on here. The youth worker's teaching that young man to trust, to show up, to be there, for another human being, someone who just a little while ago was a stranger. This willingness to be in genuine relationship with another, to take them in, is actually a huge ask. When the going's good, it's fun, it's easy. For example, it's a great conversation with a friend about the TV crime series that you're both watching when you disagree on what's really happening and you know they have this conversation and, and she says something about one of the main characters that you completely overlooked. But when you see it, it seems obvious and you change your mind about the entire plot and where the series is going. Being in genuine relationship with another is hard, sometimes impossible, when instead of being open to that person's experience and insights, we're rigid with judgment of who they are or of how badly we think they've behaved. I, and I suspect all of you, have experienced shutting down to another person in this way many times. Romantic betrayal, physical or emotional abuse, comments you feel are racist or sexist. That person who gets a job you really wanted, even though they're not as qualified as you and didn't care about it as much as you. Right here in Aotearoa, however, we've recently witnessed the most extraordinary example of responding to threats without violence or verbal abuse. This is the second thing that generalised love can help us with. What I'm talking about is the unbelievably gracious response of Muslim leaders after the mosque attacks in Christchurch on March 15, 2019. Here was a community that had just suffered enormous, really unthinkable harm. And yet, they embraced and expressed gratitude for the attempts of their fellow citizens to convey their horror and to show support and aroha in the days and weeks that followed. All over New Zealand, Muslim communities opened up mosques and held services. The one I went to at the Ponsonby Mosque included speeches by politicians, and by Muslim, Jewish and Christian leaders. The message at those services, underpinning it all, was that we are a community with meaningful links. Let's do the work to honour, to acknowledge and to strengthen those links. The compassion and forgiveness of so many Muslims here in Aotearoa offered us all an incredibly powerful lesson. The man at the centre of this photo is Farid Ahmed. 
As a young man, Farid Ahmed was involved in a car crash that left him paraplegic. He was cared for by his wife, Husna, and with her by his side, came to forgive the drunk driver who had caused the accident. Then, tragically, Husna was fatally shot by the gunman on March 15th. In a book Farid wrote about his wife and the Christchurch massacre, he wrote, When the killer entered Masjid al-Nur, he was apparently greeted with love and respect. Hello, brother, it seemed the man at the door said. That man was the first victim of the shooting. The killer did not value the sanctity of human life. He did not consider that he was killing people who mattered. He killed hard-working, peace-loving, caring Kiwis. But the lives of others are precious. I vowed to do whatever I could to counteract his actions of hate with a message of love and forgiveness. I prayed the violence would stop there. Hatred, anger, fear, these are all absolutely human. They're feelings that arise up in almost all of us in response to threats. These can be threats to who we are, these can be threats to what we stand for, these can be threats to people that we love and care for. Psychological research shows these emotions narrow our, atten our attention, which can be really useful because they prompt us to take direct action in relation to that threat. Fear, for example, leads us to withdraw and anger to attack. But the trouble with these emotions, even though they have their place at times, is that they shut us down. They turn us away from openness and possibility. To remain open to relationship, that state of generalised love in the face of enormous loss and threat is almost superhuman. And perhaps it's why it's so often associated with being part of a faith community. The Catholic priest Richard Rohr has written that forgiveness is to let go of our hope for a different or better past. It's a great quote. <laughs> I could think about it for a while. Forgiveness in this sense is not, of course, to endorse or to excuse destructive, violent or discriminatory action, but it is to accept things as they are and to say, let's keep trying, trying to make them better. So how does generalised love help us have the cross-sector, cross-culture, cross-community conversations we need to tackle the wicked problems that we face, things like climate change and material inequality. Generalised love, remember, is a sense of wonder. It's a deep appreciation for what is. And it's extreme benevolence, wanting the best for everything. When we're in love in this sense, we're fully present to the moment, to the place we're in, and to the people that we happen to be with. One way to try and foster this orientation in community conversations is through storytelling. I've helped run many workshops that invite people in groups of about five to talk about their background, experiences, values, the people they're close to, and their hopes for the future. After each person has spoken, those listening reflect back some of what they've heard and how it's similar or different to their own lives. Time after time, I've seen it over and over. When people talk to each other at that really personal level, in a situation that, that means everyone has space and which ensures really active listening, they see there's both diversity, so much diversity out there in people's lives, but there's also a real commonality, a human thread that runs through us all. And when conversations like this work well, it's, like, it's just like that oxygen carbon exchange that I mentioned earlier. Basically, we give up a little bit of ourselves, floats away out there, and we absorb a little bit of them. And from there, from this sort of level of understanding of diversity and commonality, you can move to making collective decisions with just that bit more understanding and openness to the other. If we had longer and were together in person, 
I'd ask you all to take five minutes to do this, to find a stranger who will soon be your friend and to tell each other, one person, then the other, where you were born, who you grew up with, what you love doing, what you think the world needs right now. And I'd ask you to, to really listen and respond to each other and, and notice if when you parted, there was something just a little bit different about you. If there is, it's worked. Compassionate listening is another way to develop your capacity to be open to someone else. You can turn this into a game. Find a friend and think of an issue that you know you disagree on. Maybe you've been there in the past. I recommend choosing something playful to start with, like whether the Game of Thrones was the best TV series ever made. Or maybe, whether it's legitimate that a bat, Pekka Pekka Tō Roa, won the Bird of the Year in Aotearoa in 2021. Isn't it cute? Super cute, but it's not a bird. It has to be real, something you both do actually have an opinion on. Then one of you starts talking and the other listens and asks questions till they really feel they understand the position that you hold. Or maybe they get to the point where they realize, actually, there's something really different here. You reach a point of stuckness from which you feel that there isn't more conversation to be had at that time. Then it's the other person's turn to explain and to be questioned. Maybe you'll agree at this point, or maybe there'll still be that gap between you. If you can hold that, that sort of feeling of stuckness that comes when you realize you've reached a point of difference, but still remain genuinely interested in the other person, you've listened with compassion. Imagine if we tried to do that all the time and on lots of contentious issues. Imagine if we stood back a little bit, allowed each other to be, and then maybe re-enter the conversation on another day. The practice of love is a discipline. It's nourished by the state I've described, a sense of wonder, deep appreciation for what is, and extreme benevolence, wanting the best for everything. But if we want to do love well, we need to put it into action. We can't just float in a state of bliss, lovely as that might sound. And the wonderful thing is that none of us is or can do it alone. Let's have another look at that word cloud. Some of these words may have been things you'd have never thought of when asked to describe what is sacred, precious or special. Maybe truth is you're actually not that interested in art or nature or children. That's okay. Isn't it great that some people are? It's not actually down to you to carry the whole world on your shoulders. You're one tiny person in constant relationship with other people and the environment. My invitation is that you settle into that and try in your own imperfect way to practice love.